Welcome to Blogging Theology, and today we have a special guest, Abdurrahim Roberts, who's a British person living in Kuwait. Welcome to Blogging Theology, sir. Thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, well, I, I was really taken by um, a short video clip you did on TikTok um, just recently about living in Kuwait. And um, I'm just going to share, it's only about a minute long or less to share that with everyone and just talk about that. I think it's really, really interesting about what it is to be a Muslim convert uh, from Britain living in Kuwait and your experience of life there. So I'm just going to play that. Sure. Here we go. This is one of the main reasons I love living in Kuwait. <laughs> I'm a Muslim and this is one of the reasons we moved here is to be in a place where it's very easy to practice Islam and learn Arabic and all that kind of thing but as non-Muslims there are plenty of non-Muslims working here um, and I'd love for people in the West to actually hear from those people who actually lived in the Middle East because there are so many let's just call them lies distributed about Islam I like women are treated as second citizens if you come to the Middle East I mean I've lived in Kuwait I've lived in Saudi Arabia I've lived in the Emirates I've lived in Oman women are treated like queens, princesses, um, they're treated with such huge amount of respect and if you speak to any honest non-Muslim expat who's lived and worked in the Middle East, they'll tell you the same thing. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you like this content and if you have any suggestions for content you'd like me to make, please let me know. That's lovely. And you've got 60,000 subscribers on TikTok, which is a huge following, so I've had that. Um, so you said several things that are absolutely fascinating, but just before we get to your experience in Kuwait, I think it's really important what you said there. Could you explain how you as a, a Welshman actually within the British Isles came to embrace Islam? I think it was some time ago, wasn't it? Yes, in uh, 1999, uh, back in uh, Indonesia, actually. Um, I, uh, when I left university, I decided I wanted to travel. Um, I graduated with electronics uh, engineering and I wanted to travel the world, but I didn't want to kind of just bounce around, you know, surfing and things like that. You know, not, not saying there's anything wrong with that. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to actually travel and work. So that's, uh, I managed to find myself a job with a, a company that, that enabled me to do that. And sooner or later found myself over in Indonesia. Um, I've, I've actually got quite a lot of videos on my YouTube. I'm not plugging the channel. I'm just, I don't, I don't want to make, you know. Uh, oh, you've got a YouTube channel. I forgot to mention that. Yes, folks, he has a YouTube channel. Uh, lots of interesting stuff on that too. Forgot to not mention. plugging. I'm not plugging. I'm just, I'm just I saying. I have, I have a bunch of, <laughs> I have a bunch of videos on my channel there. Um, that there's some videos in English. I, I try to do them in Arabic and in Indonesian as well, because, um, you know, I, one of the things I like to do is, is, is try my best, even though I sometimes butcher it a little bit, is to speak in other languages because it's really important to, to you know, that one of the things I've learned is when you speak to people in their, in their own language, um, it makes a huge difference. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's another thing which I like to try and do. But yes, um, so anyway, to get back to the story, mm. um, I found myself in Indonesia. Um, yeah. After about a year of being there, you know, I was told I had to, to come back to the UK for... Uh, it was a, a kind of a um, monetary crisis happened in the world at that time, back in about 1999. Um, so, yeah, I um, decided that uh, I'd ask uh, my wife, who's my wife now, to, to marry me. And at the time she said to me, look, you know, you're, you're Christian or your Christian background and I'm a Muslim. So, I, you know, it's not something I'm allowed to do. I can't, I can't marry a, a non-Muslim. So, you know would you consider becoming a Muslim? Mm. So I, I, I went and did some research. I traveled back to the UK for about three months, did some research. And um, I, I became convinced uh, through that uh, research. Um, some might say, you know, you were trying to convince yourself because of you wanted to get married, et cetera, et cetera. But if that was the case, I probably wouldn't still be practicing it 22 years mm -hmm. later. So yeah. So the, anyway, the, the rest is kind of history, as they say, but that's, 
that's why Indonesia is, uh, you know, it's a uh, has a big part in my heart. <laughs> yeah, well. yeah, it's, it's the biggest Muslim population in the world, isn't it? Indonesia. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's amazing, uh, and it's not an Arab country. Just that the, the first myth is that the largest mm. Muslim country in the world is not an Arab country, <laughs> and they don't speak Arabic there. At least not as their national. It's not their Indonesian language, isn't it? It's, it's very different from Arabic. Yeah, Bahasa Indonesia is a totally different language. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary. Now, in your short clip, you you stress the about the lies that are told uh, in the West, whether deliberately or just old wives' tales that circulate about Islam and about the role and status and experience of women in the Middle East. Um, and presumably in Indonesia, could you just expand about that? What, what, what's your because our Western Western perception of Islam is uh, a very harsh and uh, 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 religion, uh, and and women are treated badly. You know, we have images of the the Taliban and so on. But what, what's the reality in your experience of spending years in these countries um, as a Brit, and you still are a British citizen? I understand. So you know, you, you what, what, how do you experience things? You know, what do you see? So, so it's funny you should say about the Taliban because whenever I think about um, how a non-Muslim living in the West might perceive uh, how Muslims treat uh, or how women in Islam are treated, that's what I always think about. I always think about those scenes we saw years ago of um, you know bearded men with turbans beating women in these blue burqas. You know that was what was on the news. So that's what stays in your mind. That's what that's what is kind of propagated and inculcated in the minds of people. Um, but when, when I moved to the Middle East, and at the time when I moved to the Middle East back in 2005, I'd never been to the Middle East before. Hmm. I'd never been on Umrah, on Hajj or anything. I, it was the first time I found myself in Abu Dhabi. And um, I mean, having worked over here now 15 years, the, hmm. there's a stark contrast between those scenes of the, that I saw on the news, which I believe is such a minority case um i mean maybe that is happening in certain places maybe i really hope it isn't um because everything i've learned you know i sit with uh, uh scholars when i can here in kuwait uh, and i've never <laughs> i've never heard anything except for treat women well the, the one those of you who are the best are, are the, the ones who treat your families the best the women the best there's so many so many narrations from the prophet muhammad and so that, 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 just to pause on that very statement, that that's actually a quote from Muhammad, the, the, the prophet, uh, the last prophet. Uh, so, so can you just repeat that again uh, about how you treat your women? What did he say? Um, I, 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 I don't, I, I'm paraphrasing, so you know, please yeah, yeah. don't everyone say, oh, you don't know the hadith properly. But I believe, if I'm correct, it was yeah. those of you who are best are those who are best to their families. Or he, he said, so was salam, your, your um your wives and right. I am the best of you saying that he right. Salam, was the best example of someone who treats uh, his his family the best and we know reverse, also from the reverse, wives of the Prophet. On, yeah the reverse stress on treating women in the best possible mm. way if, if you're going to be a good Muslim follow an example of the Prophet and his teaching then treating women very well is is absolutely essential yeah and I, I urge uh, non-Muslim women who maybe have this misperception to, you know, kindly and nicely and, and neighborly approach, uh, you know, Muslims in the UK or in the West, uh, Muslim ladies, and, and ask them, you know, have, have a chat with them, have an open discussion. Don't, yeah. you know, don't, I'm not saying attack. I'm saying just, just try, if we want to be objective and we want to know what the truth is, then it, it's incumbent upon us to, to ask questions openly and be objective about it, not to have a preconception mm. in our mind because that preconception might be wrong you mm. know so mm. open yourself up and speak to people we you know we should do the same because we're in, in the uk there's a lot of islands if you like of people who are uh, you know isolated if you like by culture not by islam you know maybe there's a, i've seen it myself in the uk so you know i'd advise people to, to talk to each other within within reason and and that's what i'm trying to do on my channel is to, is to tell people look you know, I, I've been in Oman, I've been in Kuwait, I've been in Saudi Arabia, and, and I've seen the way that people treat, the men treat the women, and it's with a great deal of respect. Like my wife, for example, she chooses to wear the, the face veil. She chooses to wear it. I don't force her to wear it. <laughs> but um, when we go to the, to, to, you know, to the supermarket or something, you know, people will open the pathway for her 
and they'll let her in the door first. They'll move out of the way, let her take the trolley before them. They'll, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's, wow. some people might say that chauvinism, I don't, I don't know, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't mean, mind being treated like that myself. So. <laughs> I can tell you, it's very different, different, different in Tesco's here in London when you're going around. Yes. It's, a, it's a bit savage, everyone for himself. I don't think people yes. would make, I can't imagine anyone making way for a, a lady who had a hijab or a face veil on. Or maybe I'm wrong, but I, I've not seen it yet anyway. In London, I mean. No, it's very much the case in, in the Middle East. I mean, uh, like I say, that's one of the main reasons, my, you know, we, we like it in Kuwait because we feel very safe. It's a very safe place here for, yeah. for Kuwaitis and expatriates. Right, it's a safe place. It's, it's a good place to bring up children, obviously, bring up families. Um, yes, um, yeah. absolutely. There are many places in the West where it's not, not always a great place to bring up children for a variety of reasons. Um, not just for physical safety, but for other, other reasons, a sense of the pressure to change Islam, to conform to certain ideological agendas which are being pushed very heavily at the moment in schools and in the media without going into all those issues. But, uh, um, you know, that, that's quite a big issue at the moment. So you obviously don't get that in Kuwait. You're not, you're, your children are not being forced to um, have different understandings of alternative lifestyles and so on and promote those in the schools and well i mean uh uh it, it it's a case really for me of um the school here my kids actually they actually go to british school oh. um and I'm, I'm i'm happy with what they're being taught you know we see the syllabus the syllabus is very much respecting the kuwaiti um uh what's the word i'm looking for um the education ministry guidelines are, are very clear on what they can and can't teach. And so, you know, that's, that's pretty much in line, you know, while I moved out and everything. So, yeah, you know, I'm not criticizing anyone. I'm just saying this is how I choose to, uh, to live my life. And other, other, other people may choose a different way, but it's just unfortunate when you, you know, if, if nobody would want me to force my views on them and I don't just like, mm -hmm. you know, we, we hope that it, it, the reverse would be the case, you know, just respect so, and influence. So, just curious, are, are there many other English uh, or British expats living in Kuwait in your experience, or are you a small minority? Um, well, I work in an American company, and uh, over the years, well, when I first came out here, there was a lot more expatriates from, from various uh, places. But uh, now, I'd say the European countries, the Western countries, have, have kind of petered out a little bit in their presence. It's become more and more difficult to um, to, to be uh, you know an expat out here uh, for various reasons, financial reasons, um, you know, recent situation with COVID, so on and so forth. No. But for me, the reason I came out here with my family it was for it was for Islamic reasons. So those reasons are st still valid for me, and I, I you know trying my best to uh, uh, to remain here for those reasons. So, so but, yeah, there's not not as many of us as used to. Be. No. Sorry, Paul. So no, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I just, could you sorry. expand on, on uh, what you love about Kuwait, living there as a Muslim, which makes you want to stay there, as opposed to say living in London or, or Cardiff or wherever. What, what what is it that you love about Kuwait Islamically that gives mm. you that sense of wanting to really be there rather than anywhere else in the West? Right. Well, don't get me wrong. Um, I'm British and I'm very proud of being British. I'm very proud and happy for the education, the upbringing. Um, my parents, my sister, um, you know, I'm, my whole family, extended family, you know, everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying in any way, shape or form that, that any of that is um, something I don't like. I'm very proud of it, you know, and I always say that to people. But um, it, it's just, it was just a fact that when I was living in the UK, it was quite difficult to, to practice Islam. And, and, and when, I, when I compare it to Kuwait, um, you know, it's just wonderful for example absolutely anywhere you go there's a, a masjid or a mosque whatever you want to want to call or right. there's a, a prayer room and at any mall you go to in kuwait there's uh, several tens of prayer rooms and the azan will come with inside the mall wow. um if you're outside and it's prayer time guaranteed you can just pull off at the, at the next turning and, and within two minutes you'll find uh, a masjid um so for a point of view of, uh, you know, from Islam, an Islamic point of view, the first thing us Muslims, you know, should be thinking about is our, is our prayers, you know, keeping our prayers, doing them on time, praying in the congregation for the men. And it's just very easy to do that here. Right. Uh, 
the, sec the second thing is, is um, the sec you know, the security you feel. I mean, when I was in the UK, the places that I lived, I always, you know, I wouldn't leave my wallet in the car or, you know, sometimes I felt a bit worried about leaving the radio in the car or, you know, back in the days when you had those pull-out ones. Um, and, uh, yeah, here in Kuwait, I mean, I, I've left my car open by accident with my wallet on the seat overnight and, you know, I didn't, I wouldn't feel any concern that someone was going to take it. Um, it's a very, very, you know, I, and these, these are, these are things that, you know, I wish in the UK that I guess the third thing you'd say is based on the security, um, you know, I, a few times, especially my wife, she, she got people, you know, wailing at her in the UK yeah. on the street because she was wearing hijab. She wore the hijab there, not the niqab and yeah. people, you know, would, would, would scream things at her and, you know, make right. comments and even myself, I remember one time I was outside a mosque in the UK and uh, it, all the Muslims in the UK know that in the summertime, the Isha prayer kind of coincides with pub closing time. So, you know, we were coming out of the mosque <laughs> and the guys were coming out of the pub and, you know, it's just a, uh, a bit incendiary. So, you know, certain comments and certain people, you know, they've got a bit too much drink in them and they might do something. So, you know, I, uh, I, I just, I really just, honestly, Paul just wants to do my own thing. I don't want to bother anyone else. I just want to be safe doing it. So over here in Kuwait, it's that that's offered. Wow. So do you see yourself just living there now for the rest of your life? Or is that you've not thought that far ahead perhaps? Uh, it's not, I don't think it's really practical because um, uh, in Kuwait, uh, it, it's not possible to get um, like a permanent residency or, or citizenship. Um, so, you know, um, that's just the nature of, of most of the Gulf countries uh, for political dynamics and so on and so forth. It's, it's you know, it's, um, it's out, of, out of my control, but uh, mm. I, I'd, I'd maybe, you know, like to, to move to Indonesia at some point uh, in the future or something like that. But as long as I can stay in Kuwait, it would be, it would be great. Yeah. Well, what's the, I'm just curious, what's the difference between being uh, an expat living in Kuwait and an expat living in Indonesia in terms of your experience? I mean, apart from things like the food and the climate, but what, I mean, is, is there much difference or are they both equally kind of places you can feel at home as a practicing Muslim? Just yeah, no, you can, you can definitely feel at home in, in, uh, in both places. Mm -hmm. um, Indonesia is, uh, it's a different dynamic because the, the culture is very different and uh, yeah. obviously they don't speak Arabic. But, um, you, yeah, I mean, you can, you can learn the Qur'an, there's masjids everywhere, there's, um, you know, practicing Muslims everywhere, there's, there's a lot of, there's a, a big Christian community, there's obviously a lot of Hindu community in Indonesia, for example, in Bali, you know, it's a beautiful country for, for, for like tourism and things like that. Um, right. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're two different, um, two different dynamics really there. The Arab people are yeah. a different, a very different culture to the Indonesians, but both are very livable um, right. countries. I mean, perfectly livable. And even if you're not a Muslim, mm. both places are, I, I've never seen anything but respect uh, towards uh, uh, non-Muslim people in Kuwait, especially people that are, you know, coming with like, for example, skills and experience that, that are needed to uh, to bring to the country and to develop the local uh, talent right. and things like that. You know, they're, they're always very welcoming of that. Because you mentioned, I think, uh, in one of your TikTok videos, I think that you know, there are a lot of non-Muslims living in Kuwait. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, not yeah there are. Uh, how, I mean, are they allowed to practice their faith in, in uh, Kuwait? Oh, absolutely, yeah. They have, um, they have like a uh, couple of churches, well, more than a couple of churches here. I mean, established churches where they, they go and worship on... Uh, I think they do it on Fridays here because of the way the weekend is. But uh, mm. I mean, no, there, there's no um, re people are just left to to, to practice their you know their own thing. As I guess, as long as people are not kind of um, you know actively trying to convert people, you know, in the street, it's it, it's not really. I guess it's more to keep the peace. You know, just do do your own thing and keep yourself to yourself. There's a, there's a place for you to worship. There's a place for you, you know, we'll just all go and do our own thing. And it's all very, it all works very nicely. And Indonesia, was that your experience as well in terms of the, uh, the practice of Christians and others, Jews perhaps? Yeah, very much. Yeah, very yeah. much. I mean, um, 
that if, if you go to the biggest masjid in Jakarta, which is called Masjid Istiqlal, it's a huge masjid. I hope, hope one, te- one day you can, uh, you can visit Paul. Um, mm-hmm. If you look directly across the road, there's a huge cathedral. Um, but yeah, it, you know, so that just kind of goes to tell you the dynamic in Indonesia. You have a lot of, uh, you know, different uh, religions. And it, the, the Pancasila, the kind of the basis of Indonesian um, life in Indonesia, it's, it's, uh, it's like in Indonesia, I haven't memorized it, but it's something that the kids in Indonesia memorize at school. It's their kind of creed for Indonesia and it's, it's freedom of uh, religious worship. Right. Because I, I, I've had the, the honor of having uh, Rabbi Tovi Singer on Blogging Theology, and he was actually the rabbi for Indonesia at one point. I mean, really, oh, rabbi really? for the whole nation. Yeah, he was officially, I mean, uh, with the government. And uh, he's now moved to Jerusalem. Um, he's an American originally. Mm-hmm. He's American. Um, but no, he, he had a very, po- I mean, he was hugely popular amongst Muslims, and he had a very positive experience as a, a rabbi living in uh, Indonesia for a long time, um, doing what rabbis do, you know, building communities and reaching out and so on. So, yeah, and just to confirm mm-hmm. what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I know. He, he, he said that. Um, he's, he's now in Jerusalem. Um, I'm not sure why he's in Jerusalem now, but anyway, it's not, not, not the point. Um, Anybody that goes to Indonesia will, will not want to, to leave, you know. it's uh, Really? It's uh, such an amazing place. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. Gosh, it's amazing. Um, well, I mean, you talked about the, the you used quite strong language about the lies about Islam. I mean, are there any kind of mm. real kind of uh, sort of fake news items uh, that, that you just want to mention? You mentioned freedom of worship, freedom of religion, the status and respect shown to women, you know, even walking around the supermarket where, you know, courtesy, these are all, I think in British terms, that would be seen as very, very traditional um, etiquette and, and mm. just very well mannered so it wouldn't be seen as wrong i don't think but certainly many people would see that as a, a, a very respectful way of you know relating to, to to men and women relating to each other but are there any kind of fake i fake news items that uh that some of us in the west still have that would need to be challenged do you think um the thing is like maybe in my video i use the word lies maybe untruths would be a best a better mm. way of putting it because i don't think most of the cases that people actually um, say things that they don't actually lie, you know, on purpose. No, we, don't, we don't know. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there are certain things which um, you know, which people uh, you know, deliberately mislead others, you know, to sell newspapers. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just um, that purely would be, mm. you know, just me uh, thinking out loud. But um, I can't really think of. Um, it, it, it seems to me it's just the perception. Once people have a perception and they commit to that perception, they talk to it, to their friends about it and, you know, they express their mm-hmm. opinions. It's kind of psychologically as if they start to commit themselves to a particular way of thinking about Islam and Muslims. Mm-hmm. And when something comes along which, which is counter to that perception, which they've kind of committed to, because commitment and consistency, I've, I've talked about this in a few of my other videos, actually, it's some really fascinating books on psychology about this. Commitment and consistency is a very, very powerful psychological uh, construct in all of our minds. And I noticed right. this as, as well. Once people say, well, you know what? I, I've decided that I think Muslims treat women badly. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's what I think. And I also think, you know, X, Y, and Z. Because I saw it on Fox News and I read it in this paper and, and you know, that's it. And I'm going to go and talk to my friends about it. They're yeah. also going to agree with me, validation. And then you start to commit to something, which is totally wrong. And then when someone comes and challenges you and says, I'm a Muslim, I'm a revert, I became a Muslim. You know, I treat my wife very well. You know, um, <laughs> you know probably the best thing to ask yourself, um, you know, ask other Muslim women, you know, actually find out maybe there are some people that treat women badly i mean god forbid but that certainly isn't from islam so if that's no. what's being propagated in the west and then the newspapers yeah. and in the media mm-hmm. if what's being propagated about the middle east and, and arabic people is that they're you know all wearing turbans and beat their women it's this is completely false that's it. Mm-hmm. so um you know that's what frustrates me and that's why i'm trying to make some content to say you know look look at this people are doing their own thing people are practicing over here this is why I'm here because I can hear the adhan. I think it's a beautiful thing, and um, yeah. yeah anyway. So, what's the adhan? Just for anyone who doesn't know what the adhan is, what what is the adhan? 
the adhan, so the adhan is the call to prayer, um, right. which is called five times a day um, in countries where uh, people practice Islam, obviously like Kuwait and uh, in Indonesia. So, um, for example, at Fajr time, you have five prayers. Fajr, which is the, which is the early morning prayer mm-hmm. uh, before sunrise. Then you have Zuhur, which is, uh, um, for example, here just before midday. Then Asar, Maghrib and, and Isha. These, these are the four, uh, five prayers, sorry. And then each of these prayer times, the Adhan will be called. And um, I give you a, a, a nice story. When my father came over to, to Kuwait, um, where he was sat here, uh, he was sat on, on one of the, the, the side of one of the rivers um, up in the town there. And he heard the Adan being called from the other side of the creek. And uh, I'd actually gone with my son to pray. And uh, when, when I came back, my wife was all excited. She said, God, your dad, he said to me, he said to me, wow, that, uh, that Adan is beautiful. There's something, something I felt in it, you know. So I can't remember exactly what she said, but I was quite struck by that. I've heard it from a lot of people, a lot of non-Muslims that have heard yeah. the Adan feel some kind of a spiritual, you know, Connection or thing, yeah, some kind of YouTube video of, uh, sort of a British, uh, you know, well, famous one of a, of a, a British journalist. Uh, she went to, I forget where it was, certainly a Muslim country, and heard the Adan. Saudi Arabia, I think that one was. It was uh, yeah, yeah, and she was just so, you know, visibly moved by the whole because the, the, yeah. there were many Adans going off, and uh, for her, it was an extraordinary experience. And uh, I suppose the parallel here would be in a traditional village where you have the, you know, the, 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 the church bells going off on a Sunday. It still happens here, actually, where I'm in London. You know, the, the bells in the local church will go off, calling everyone to come mm. to church. That's just like once a week. <laughs> so yes. it's, um, it's not five times a day, of course. Um, but it's, it's the human voice, isn't it? It's not, it's not um, the, the ram's horn or, or the bells or anything like that. It's, no, it's, no, it's, uh, it's, the, it's, voice. it's the voice of, what we, of the person we call the Mu'adzin. So it's Adhan and the one who does the Adhan is called the Mu'adzin. Um, and um, I'll try, what, I, what I was planning to do actually on my channel is to you know, stand outside a few masajid and just, uh, just record the Adhan as it's going off. But yeah, yeah. it's not the same thing as actually standing there and listening to it yourself. It's really something... Uh, you know, something, because it's, it's like calling one of the people in the vicinity of this place of worship to come and inviting them to come and reminding them to actually worship uh, the Creator. So if, mm. if you actually think of it, if people actually, if those people who are not religious actually stop and think for a minute, what if there was a Creator? You know, this is, is, isn't this, you know, and he, because he, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'll, I'll say it in Arabic. وَمَا خَلَقْتَ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Which means, he did not, I did not create the mankind or the jinn, which is another type of creation, except to worship me. So our purpose of uh, existence, Muslims believe, is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way he told us to worship him. So when you hear the adhan, it's, 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 it's us being reminded to go and do that worship. Mm, so, mm. you know, as a Muslim, that's, you know, something very dear to me, all Muslims, you know, when, when we hear that, we, you know, we feel a sense of uh, uh, kind of um, resonance and pride and, and happiness. No, no it's marvellous. Well, thank you very much for sharing that uh, beautiful um, experience. Um, fantastic. Um, welcome. Well, um, is there anything else in, in, perhaps in conclusion you want to, to share with the viewers about your uh, love of Kuwait or, and, or your experience of practicing Islam in the Middle East? Or the- well, I think um, over here in Kuwait uh, is a very family-oriented uh, country. So it, it's a small country. There's a lot of uh, people st- tend to stay you know, together in their family units. And uh, of course, the problem is when expats come over, like English British, you know, French, whatever, and they don't speak Arabic. So, um, oh. how, how this is the problem? But I think they, we feel a little bit intimidated because Arabic yeah. can sometimes sound a little bit, you know, uh, intimidating. It, it can, but I've, I've often found, like uh, I always say to my Egyptian friends, the first time I heard two Egyptian people speaking to each other, I thought they were about to have a fight, but they were just having a chat. Uh. You know, it's like. <laughs> It's just sometimes it sounds a little bit aggressive, but it's not. It's, it's a beautiful language and I've spent quite a lot of time learning it. I'm still very much an intermediate student, but that's one barrier. But if you go and you approach Kuwaiti people, you talk to them, they're very, very welcoming. 
Uh, they're right. very, very warm people. They're extremely generous. I haven't come across people who are so generous. Wow. Um, yeah, it's incredible. Like if, 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 if they invite you to the house or if you speak to them, they'll tell you, come to my house, come and sit with us. They'll treat you like a king. Mm. Um, they'll, they'll probably start talking to you about Islam for sure. Uh, because you know it's 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 a great pride for 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 people over here, alhamdulillah. And uh, yeah, for me personally as a Muslim, coming over and um, and you know talking in Arabic and, and trying to express myself in Arabic, um, they're so happy to uh, to speak to me and ask me, "Wow, you can speak Arabic?" And I said, "Yeah, I speak a little bit." And then it starts. Oh, you're still modest. I mean, I, I, well, when I hear you speak Arabic, as in some of your videos are just in Arabic, uh, you know, on your TikTok videos, I mean, your accent absolutely brilliant. I mean, you'd never, I, I would, I never know you were, you weren't an Arabic speaker natively. Um, so I'm very oh, impressed. The Arabic, the Arabic speakers would, would. No, I appreciate that, but the the Arabic speakers uh, will will be able to tell very quickly that uh, <laughs> my Arabic is limited. But uh, I try one tries one's best, you know. Um, it's it's. Uh, it, it's a great source of pleasure to me, actually, to, to, to be able to interact with people here in Kuwait. And, and, you know, I'm very happy to be here. And, you know, I just want to, uh, you know, tell people great things about Kuwait because it's a great place. It's been very good to me. Mm. So, uh, yeah. And, and also, you know, I, I, we could do a whole other thing about Indonesia as well. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stick, it, stick to Kuwait for now. <laughs> No, that's, that's fantastic. I, I, I just stress that viewers, uh, you know, should follow follow you on uh, TikTok. Sixty thousand. He's got sixty thousand followers for a reason. Uh, his uh, his short videos are absolutely fascinating, particularly if you want to, um, you know, experience a little bit of uh, Muslim life in Kuwait from uh, a kind of. British point of view, even it's uh, fascinating, and uh, and and you obviously have a YouTube channel uh, which is uh, scandalously undersubscribed, but um, I hope that will grow <laughs> as it should do. Um, and uh, well, and thank you very much for you know giving of your time uh, today, and um, and uh, well, thank you so much. And well, well that was here. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Absolute pleasure, Paul. Thank you very much for uh, for having me on. It's really uh, really good of you to do that. Okay, thank you. Till next time.